Right. So you heard all, everything there is to know about all sky seven. No, it's not true. I mean, I mean, in the situation like Jericho, uh, we are running behind the all sky seven development and trying to understand what Mike is doing and what Zirko is doing. And uh, luckily, I have some help there. There's Michael Fulau, who's a postdoc, uh, sorry, a PhD candidate at the University of Munich. And we have a number of students where we try to support a bit the work that Mike and Zirko and the others in the team are doing to get a better handle on the performance of the system. The cameras that I'm involved in are these. I have a camera in North Vika House where you see the most important person here is Gabi because she manages to go up in heights where I'm scared, I'm afraid of heights. So all the cameras that are installed, be it all Sky 7 or Free Fall, always Gabi is the key person there. So we are uh, operating a few cameras from the European Space Agency also. There we had two installed recently in Spain. And the goal that we are after in, in our group, I work in the Planetary Defense Office of the European Space Agency. We are not so much interested in the meteorites on the ground. That's more other people's business. We don't want to mess with that, too much politics. We are interested in the flux density. So something that Zirko was addressing with the uh, flux data from, from the IMO video cameras. We want to know how many of the bigger objects are there. And with bigger, we really mean meter size, tens of meter size. And the two approaches we're following, we're looking at asteroid observations and model the, the flux density from that side. We're looking at fireball observations where we look at the small stuff. And then if you extrapolate, then hopefully you get a good handle on the flux density this here is the cumulative number per square meter in second. So that's the flux density of particles uh, as a function of meteoroid mass. And you see there are deviations here this is based on data from our camera system in the Canary Islands, which only records the small stuff because it has a small field of view. But now we want to extend that to fit on data, to all sky seven data, to a GMN data, whatever you have there. Okay. And of course, it's just in general scientifically interesting to get a, a closer handle on the distribution of, in particular, the large objects. Where you see, you know, this is the curve from Eberhard Grün, which was modeled based on a lot of stuff, which is kind of the standard. And for the small objects, it fits. But here, there are deviations. That's what we're after. We want to understand that. What do we need to do? for fireball cameras to be able to check how many objects we actually see. Uh, well, the first thing is we, we, we I, I plotted this as a function of mass. How do I get the mass? Well, you know, the heavier an object for a constant velocity, the brighter it will be. And then there is an uncertainty. What's the luminous efficiency? How much of the kinetic energy is actually converted to light? But what we need is definitely we need to convert the brightness somehow into mass. Okay, so that's one of the points we need to look at. Uh, in particular, with the All Sky Seven cameras, they use rather modern technology. Modern is not always good. It's using video data, which we heard before. It has the advantage that we can actually store the complete video for many days. But the disadvantage is that's only possible if you compress the data. And that, of course, is always a word the scientist doesn't like at all. We want the raw data uncompressed in full resolution and no, nobody messes with the data. So, uh, well, there is, of course, a workaround that is try to understand what the compression does. And that's one of the tasks that we gave to our students. The other one is we want to know what's the, the area that the cameras cover. And in the middle of Germany, they just cover everything. That's easy. But uh, we still want to understand what is the real horizon. And the distance to the meteor, of course, influences the brightness. So there are all these effects that we need to look at until we can derive a plot like this. So for the coverage in time, we had two students that looked a bit at how do we understand what, uh, say, how much uh, time the the camera actually looks into the sky and there are two things that could be well there are several things it could be fog the camera could be simply off because it's broken it could be clouds 
And we followed a number of different strategies. I mean, the easiest is you just count the stars. Zirko had implemented that very nicely in, in the metric software. And uh, with the All Sky 7 cameras, if you want to do that on the video stream, at least in most cameras where I'm involved in, it's difficult because you only see a handful of stars. So it's not really good to do that. So we looked at, uh, say, satellite data. You know, and we analyze this in detail. And if you want to hear more about that, then I suggest in the coffee break you talk to Michael Fruhlauf, who's available online, because that's really an interesting topic. Uh, so we we basically found out it's very difficult. I mean, these cloud data they are not very good. Even so, they can predict the weather reasonably well. Now, if you want to know at any given point in time what's the cloud coverage, it's it's not straightforward to find that out. But we came up with a number of things. So we use humidsat data, they use satellite data and basically tell you it's clear or it's not clear. So it's a binary thing. Uh, this one is the best. We like that most, mainly because it has a fantastic acronym, ECMWFE, or whatever. <laughs> what we do is it's a model that models the weather and they link it to real measurements. So even if you only have a measurement point, say one hour every every one hour over a large grid, you can still predict even after the fact, you can say, okay, at that point in time, at that location, this is how the weather was or the cloud coverage was. So that's not bad. And we used that and compared it to the method that Zirko was using in metric to count the stars and we, we visually looked at data. And uh, this is kind of the result. Again, talk to Michael if you want to understand this in detail, but here you see time and here you see the cloud coverage and what the people in the weather service like doing, they use uh, a scale from zero to one and they always use one eighth. Don't ask me why we need Andy for answering that question. Probably historical, but you know, you have zero cloud coverage, you have one eighth, you have two eighths, four eighths, and eight eighths means it's completely cloudy. And the different colors, somehow the legend, uh, the legend is here. The different colors compare the different methods. And the red one is Michael. It says human here, but that was Michael. He actually <laughs> compared, you know, he looked at a lot of images and then made a visual estimate. And you can actually see we, we can somehow use the data. It does follow the trend. So now the advantage is we can go back in time, even if I don't have any real time detection in the camera running yet, we can go back and look at the data and correct it for time coverage. Next point, the spatial coverage. If you go to the IMO website, Circle has made this nice interface where you can plot the horizon, but that's a lie. <laughs> because the real horizon looks like this right and uh what we did is we had another student who basically takes these masked images and looks for the real horizon and then i get something like this this is now the real coverage that i have this is now a standalone python routine that we can basically use whenever there's a new camera i can press the button and it runs and generates these things for different heights and stuff like that and then the next step is now to combine everything. Like I say, in the middle of Germany, it's easy because you have 100% coverage anyway. But to just better understand what you're doing, that was a nice thing to do. This is, of course, my favorite project. Uh, this is called Schnuzi 2.0. Schnuzi is German and stands for Schnucken Simulator. <laughs> it's a simulation tool, simulate meteors. And the way it works is, I have a light source. So this box here, it's full of electronics. I don't know why, but it's modern. The student told us we need at least two Raspberry Pis to control the whole thing. <laughs> and it's talking to each other with some kind of network protocol. But in the end, I have a light here. I actually have several LEDs, which I can control very closely and set to magnitudes simply by comparing it with, with stars, right? I take a camera outside, I measure some stars, I look at the brightness in pixels, and then I can calibrate my LEDs. And the camera, this is one of the cameras that Zirko Pangi provided that you will find in the All Sky 7 system. And to simulate the movement of the meteor, we move the camera, or we rotate the camera. So I have another Raspberry Pi here, thank you. 
to control the movement of the camera and I can set it to a five degrees per second, 30 degrees per second, what have you. And what is schmoozy? This, this is what we did in 1993. We actually built a simulator for simulating meteors by projecting this uh, light source onto the wall. And then you put a slide in the star background. Uh, Zirko provided this photograph. So for that, you get one free question after the talk. <laughs> Thank you. This is an image as generated with the simulator. And this is a zoom in. And then now you can ask your, yourself the question, this, this street that you see here, is this a reflection? Does it come from the compression? This is exactly why we now have the machine. We have to use it. So we'll have more pieces coming out if any student here wants to move to the University of Munich and uh, do their master thesis there, you're welcome. The other thing we looked at is a bit the trajectories, even so that's not directly relevant for the flux densities, but still, I mean, you know, we, we also want to know where the stuff comes from. Plus the student, uh, you did, she really wanted to work on that. And this illustrates what Mike is showing. If you do nothing, then you might have cameras where uh, they're not really good. So what do we see here? The x-axis is the height of the meteor trajectory, and the y-axis is some kind of residual with respect to the average. So what I was thinking is, uh, do we actually make the results, overall results worse if we keep it cameras which are not calibrated well yet? Because Mike didn't you know, work on that yet. And if you take out this camera and redo the computation, then okay, the result still looks very similar. So that's good news. It means you can basically just take out this one camera, which is bad, and then the results still look somehow the same. So this is, again, just for us to, to learn and to understand what this, in this case, it's this Western Ontario Meteor Library, what that is doing. So I now have a, a procedure where I can step by step go through and then I can actually use this library. I still don't understand perfectly what it's doing, but we're getting it. And that's the goal of this whole activity. <laughs> so in summary, uh, we, we sort of started understanding what Mike is doing and a bit what Zirko is doing. And we're 40% there. <laughs> so next year we'll be 80% there. And if anybody is interested in the results, I mean, these people, did have to write a, a thesis, so I can provide that to you. Normally, you know, they're open, but they're not really available on the website. So just send me an email or tell me if you have interest in this. We will look for more students. Actually, it's not just the University of Munich. We can also offer positions in Oldenburg. Of course, master's offering position means you have to work and you don't get paid. So that's easy for me to send. And with that, uh, that's it. Any questions?